You join me from the uh, the rear facing garden of my house in Dublin. It's a um, it's a lovely winter's afternoon. Um, it's been a bit of a strange week for weather. Um, a lot of rain, and then it was really warm earlier in the week. Unseasonably warm again. Um, thankfully, Dublin now didn't get um, an absolute deluge of rain like some of the rest of the country did. Um, but today, Sunday. Um, which I know why, why why you're recording on a Sunday. You never usually do, John. You're probably not saying to yourself, um, but I guess that in a moment. But yeah, it's lovely. It's pleasant. It's it's the way it should be at this time of year. It's it's crisp, but not too cold. There is heat coming from the the sun, which is splitting the sky. Um, but it's nice. It's a pleasant autumn afternoon. Um, why am I recording this on a Sunday? Um, well. I was originally going to do it on Tuesday because that would make it a perfect Tuesday, Thursday, which would have made it a perfect week since the last time I did one. Um, but then I very much last minute on Thursday decided to go see the um, the Arctic Monkeys in the Three Arena, which is a crap venue, but that's where they were playing. So I, it being a lovely kind of crisp um, winter's day, I have a lovely warming cup of tea beside me here. So one second. Ah, tea. Tea's great. Um... Yeah, very last minute, so I'd go three arena, because um, originally the Arctic Monkeys were going to be playing Marley Park um, earlier in the year, um, just before Glastonbury, so whenever that is, it was the Tuesday before Glastonbury, I remember that, um, they were playing Marley Park, which would have been very, very, very handy for me, because I can get to Marley Park in about 10 minutes on a bicycle, um, which means you can fly down the bicycle, no charge lock it up in the little across the road going into the gig and then cycle home again which is handy um, but they fucking cancelled which was very disappointing because there was a big group of us going, there was about 7 or 8 of us going to that one at the next day booked off work um, but then they cancelled, they cancelled quote unquote due to illness um, there was some some, 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 uh, blah, some conspiracy theories going around that they just it was the last gig they were going to be doing before Glastonbury um, and they just weren't really arsed flying over to Ireland and expending energy and time and money um, when they could just run into Glastonbury, fresh as daisies. But um, that Glastonbury set was obviously televised, as it always is. And um, it wasn't great. They played a lot of um, a lot of the hits, but in a slower tempo, which lacked any energy, um, which is what you kind of expect from an Arctic Monkey show. Obviously, some they have some slower tempo songs and some of their later work, but not the hits. Play the hits normally. Um, give the people what they want to hear. Um, so after that then, and, and the night they were supposed to be playing in Marley Park, um, it absolutely shot down with rain as well. So um, we would have got soaked. So you know, kept telling ourselves these things, would have got pissed on. Glass and reset wasn't great. We probably dodged a bullet. Um, and we got refunded, obviously. But then they announced um, not one, not two, but three nights in the three arena. Um, Tuesday of this week, no, Monday of this week, Wednesday of this week, and Thursday of this week. Um, for a hundred euro a pop, which is I know it's kind of the norm for g- uh, gigs of that size, but expensive. And with the poor performance at Glastonbury and the fact that they screwed us over with the gig earlier in the year, none of us decided to buy any tickets. And um, yeah, and then reports are coming out near this week about recent shows they were doing and how they clearly li- listened to criticism from Glastonbury and decided to play songs as they should be played. And that the shows were quite good. And I was like, hmm. Because I'm a big Arctic Monkeys fan, as most of my generation are. They're one of the bands of, of my, our generation. And um, started hearing good reports. I was like, oh, it's going to be bad if we don't go see Arctic Monkeys. Um, and like, it, it, would, it would upset me. If there's one thing that really upsets me is missing live music. Because whether a, you know a band might do 100 shows a year on the same you know tour cycle and maybe even play the same set still the gig that you're at and the venue you're in um it's it's you know it's a snapshot in time that won't be repeated uh, and there's something like i love music in all ways shapes and forms but the live experience um that's where it's really at so yeah me and my brother every christmas um christmas day after a couple of glasses of port probably um we always go back through the year. He's a, he's a music lover as well. 
of the gigs you went to and you know discuss and if if Arctic Monkeys had been an omission from my list this year I'd have been very disappointed in myself um, so yeah so very last horrible day in work on Thursday and driving home I got into one of my mates who just found out he got a new job which he's been looking for for a few months so kind of tied in with a bit of a celebration for that we're like here will we go to the Arctic Monkeys tonight and he was like yeah let's so we did um, it was sold out but managed to get resale tickets standing um, although I'm at an age now where I don't mind sitting down at gigs uh, there are certain ones you still have to stand for Arctic Monkeys be, would be one of them um, and yeah I like I was in work early the next morning but it was a Friday so I was like one day it'll be fine about four hours sleep all in after the gig but and I was hung over to hell on Friday but totally worth it they they smashed it um, played for nearly two hours played a plethora of hits every, every album was touched on um, they, play, I say, they played the songs in the right key and tempo um, everyone was satisfied and I'm absolutely delighted I went um, as I said they're one of the bands of our generation um, Alex Turner has fully lent into being an unbelievably um, confidence that could be mis- mistook for arrogance but you know, that suave cool that a front man can and should have. Um, yeah, uh, he, he carries it and he's an unbelievable performer. Um, a highlight for me as well is Matt Helders because I pretend to play play drums. So I'm not, not in any way competent, but, you know, I, I enjoy drumming. And uh, he's one of the best drummers currently active. Um, he has his own quite unique style and watching him play live. They had big screens, obviously, as every gig does these days, but they had a big circular one in the centre the back of the stage and the cameraman was giving him uh, some time so we could really see see his his magic hands at work um but my only disappointment was um they have been playing um i want to be yours on this tour cycle from what i from, from what i gather and um, i want to be yours being the closing track on uh, am the album am um it's actually a john cooper clark poem but they 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 songized it, if that's a word. And um, they have been playing it on this tour, and it's lovely. It's a beautiful track. Um, and there's a point where a tech brought an acoustic guitar out on stage and put it into a stand beside Alex Turner, and the cameraman even zoomed in on it during the middle of a different song. Um, I think it was um, Knee Socks, possibly. Knee Socks is a great song as well. Um, well, they brought out Miles Kane as well, about a third of the way through the, or sorry, about two thirds of the way through the gig, which was great. Miles Kane, um, obviously. Uh, collaborator with the Arctic Monkeys and also um, they had uh, the duo album him and Alex Turner had um, two albums actually sorry um, under the guise of The Last Shadow Puppets going completely off topic I've been talking for I mean, I've been talking for eight minutes now and I haven't talked about cars whatsoever but um, it's been a slow week um, hence why I'm filling in with other bullshit um, yeah it was brilliant but then I, I was, when I saw the electric guitar and the fact that the, the cameraman gave focus on it and I was like oh we're going to get I want to be yours um, but we didn't um, but other than that I'd say 8.5 out of 10 all in um, it's not the best time I've seen them but you know it, it was it was far from terrible it was absolutely excellent you know it was brilliant I'm so so glad I went um, and then Friday when I was like I could have done it on Friday I'll see this podcast um, I went to go see Killers of the Flower Moon um, in the IFI um, pissing down with rain on Friday so I got nice and wet but there was a, a radiator right behind the seats I got the back row um, so I managed to dry myself off um, and it's, a, it's an excellent movie it has been touted as both uh, DiCaprio and um, Scorsese's masterpiece I think that might be a bit of a stretch like it is, it's an excellent movie and I recommend everyone go see it it is three and a half hours long so it is, it is long Um but it is an excellent like cinema, the cinematography is unbelievable the set design is unbelievable costume design is unbelievable um, the the score is unbelievable by the late Robbie Robertson but I'll come back to that um, um, I just like it. it's, it's an excellent movie I just think um, DiCaprio and Scorsese do have more um, rounded pieces of work in their back catalogue um, both together and uh, separately but it is brilliant, exactly, and it's a story that should and has been told, um, which people should um, hear, listen, watch, know about, educate themselves about. Anyway, so there's my um, 
absolute waffle of no car chat on a car podcast about um, why it's late this week. Um, I'm recording this. Um, and to be honest, I was saying, it, it's been pretty slow in the car world um, for me. Um, nothing's really happened. Didn't do anything. Didn't really see anything. Um, I saw a Vartberg uh, on Stephen Street Lower the other day. It was actually on on the Thursday. Um, the day before. Oh, no, was it the Friday? Yeah, it was the Friday. When I was incredibly hungover and lack of sleep. Um, yeah, a red and white Vartberg Vartberg 312, I think, um, is what it was called. Um, proper, you know, behind the Iron Curtain. Um communist car which is great east, east germany or where wartburg uh, were, were based um but a great thing powered by a two-stroke uh three-cylinder um engine so i say it's uh i say it's got performance for days and um, but really nice to see it was a great piece of design um kind of like american muscle meets um meets uh eastern bloc communism um and they made a car it's interesting sip of my tea which I'm spilling on myself in the same throw um, yeah that's probably the most exciting car I saw but another car that I saw um, which then a few moments later I saw a Corsa crash into a lamppost um, not sure how it happened but it was a learner driver god love them um, but before that it happened um, I was behind an Opel Carl Carl spelled with a K K-A-R-L it's an odd car it's one of those cars that like a lot of people I think, I think would even exist. I know I've I'd definitely heard of it before. Because obviously they had the Atom, um, which was kind of, I suppose it's Polo, what are cars that are still in the Polo Fiesta sized. But then see, they had, they had the Corsa as well. I don't really know where the Atom fit in. I think they always wanted it to be a mini rival, but that was never going to happen. Um, they, but then there's the Carl, which is smaller. Um, I suppose like to compete with stuff like the Up and... Um, what are small the, the car, which again that whole segment has disappeared. I love small cheap cars, but um, this Opel Carl, um, talk about a white good, un, uninspiring, no styling, which is fine. Like there are some brands like you know Dacia, um, even Kia, which you know both of which, well, not so much Dacia, but Kia have a, a pretty funky design language these days. But those cars you can kind of almost excuse and almost expect to have no styling as kind of part of the charm whereas opal general motors Vauxhall, psa whoever the fuck owns them at this point and um, you know they have a lot more heritage than that Um sort of churn out a white good like that is kind of unacceptable Um i've never driven one I've never heard about anyone driving one i'm sure it's pretty terrible i drove a course of that generation i've driven a couple of courses of that generation um, and they're rubbish they're absolutely terrible Um but yet the Opel Corsa, um, even up until last year, I believe, uh, the best-selling car in the UK. Never understood that. I think it's got the UK really still buy into the uh, the. There's a fly on my head. Good way. When you can hear him buzzing in the background. Um, yeah, I think I think the UK still kind of clings on to the fact that um, not the fact that the old was once was a fact, but is a fact only in name these days. Is that Vauxhall is a is a British brand when. It hasn't been a British brand for brand, band, brand, brand, and um, for, geez, it must be nearly 50 years now. can't remember. When did General Motors buy out Vauxhall? It's a long time ago, anyway. Not in my lifetime. Another sip of tea. Yes, yeah, so that's about the extent of my uh, my motoring week. Um, what's been going on in the world of the car? Um, not Well, there's a few things. Um, Brabus. Fucking fly. The fucking perils are doing the shit outside. Um, yeah, Brabus announced that they're going to start making, uh, they're going to start delving into the world of the resto mod, um, which will be interesting because obviously the, the the mostly wouldn't be my cup of tea. Um, Brabus, uh, Brabus tuned Mercedes, which they're mostly known for. Although they do they do they do do other things, um, but mostly Mercedes, um, overly powered with questionable styling. Um, you can't hate them but not my cup of tea I, don't, I can't imagine myself ever owning a Brabus um, some of the older stuff I suppose is, is quite cool but um, yeah they're now experimenting or exploring 
the world of doing resto mods, which I think is because um, the plethora of um, combustion engine Mercedes is, is slowly but surely starting to, to wind down and they're going to start running out of things that they can tune. Um, cause obviously a lot of the, the AMG products um, that Mercedes are doing now um, are based off the uh, the, the, the four-cylinder, the two-liter four-cylinder engine, which the power outputs that they're managing to get out of them in their in their products um, is alarmingly high. That I think maybe uh, Brab has realised that there probably isn't a whole lot of uh, uh, room left um, to squeeze out any more power, and, not, and certainly not outrageous numbers that they that they kind of trade off of. Um, so I think they're looking, yeah, and obviously the resto mod world is huge now, um, and it's only going to get bigger uh, as people lust after things from the past. Um, as we r roll into the world of the EV white good um, so it'll be interesting because obviously Brabus, look, they, they're, they're a well established large um, experienced company so their know how being put into uh, resto modding which I assume mostly will be old Mercedes will be interesting and um, they haven't mentioned exactly where what and when but it's going to happen um, bring it on I say other things launched um Oh, uh, Ferrari released the the challenge version of the uh, of the two nine six, um, which again is uh, the two nine six is one of the few uh, recent Ferraris that I have any interest in. Um, actually, quite it's it's of that sector of car at the moment. I think it's the only one I'd, I'd give any consideration to. Um, but they've yeah they they've, they haven't given full details on it because they're going to definitely um, save full information for. Finale Mondiale, which they have in Magello every year, which is kind of their, their end of the year party um, that Ferrari always throw, um, which was very prominent back in the day when they were going through the uh, the Halcyon period of the whole Jean Tot, Ross Braun, Schumacher era where they were winning everything. But still, still a great event. They bring out the Formula One cars and other race cars and historic cars, and they usually launch something. I suppose it's about as close as Ferrari you get to Ren Sport, but it's. It's still very, you know, you got to know people to get in any further than the grandstands. And even grandstand tickets, I think, are not cheap and um, very dedicated Ferrari um, fan club members and such get priority. Anyway, um, yeah, it's cool. It, it looks cool. You know, it's one of those ones, you know, well, most nearly everything, any road car that gets turned into a race car tends to look pretty cool. Big wing, more aero. Um, but like... Um, who am I trying to compare this to? But anyway, it's it's doing without the oh, comparing it to the GT th GT three car they launched last year of the two nine six, and um, like that the uh, the challenge, which you know Ferrari can do anything with the challenge technically because it's their own one make series, which has been going on for over thirty years now. The original challenge car being the three four eight, and there was the three five five, and there was the three sixty, um, the three sixty being the first one that gave us a road car version, the challenge Stradale, um. Then there was the 458 Speciale, um, road going version, uh, 488 Pista, and now this. No, was that 8? 348, 355, 360. Uh, oh, sorry, 430 Scud, obviously. Uh, 458 Speciale, uh, 488 Pista, that's 6. I was reading up about this, it says the 8th eighth generation. Was there, was there an F8 version? Oh, 488. Eight. No, 488 said a piece to 348, 355, 360, 430, 458, 488, 296. Am I missing one? Anyway, going completely off topic. Um, it's doing without the. the it's, so it's the first V6 of the Challenge Cars. Um, no hybrid gubbins, but the, the 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 combustion engine will be good for seven hundred plus horsepower. The challenge though is, is is cool. I don't think it follows. It, did, did it ever partner the Formula One? Or did Porsche have exclusive rights on that? Um, the Porsche Cup, Porsche GT Cup, um, is great. It, it was a support race at the Austrian Grand Prix I went to last year, and they definitely were the best sounding um, of the race cars, bar the. The uh, the V10, FW, the BMW Williams, um, Formula One car, and 
there was a V12, then Nicky Lauda, Ferrari did a demo laps, um, but they weren't racing of other racing cars. The Porsche uh, Cup cars were the best sounding. Um, but yeah, no, getting completely off topic here. The 296, um, 296 Challenge, um, give it a Google. It's a great looking race car. And um, it's good to see that. It's booking a trend, I suppose, by, by taking the hybrid, hybrid hybridization of the road car out for the racing purposes and, you know, going with just pure combustion, which we all love. Um, what other... Oh yeah, I'll kind of to segue in from that into um, Aston Martin that I mentioned, mentioned last time. Aston Martin, Aston Martin are now confirmed that they're going back to the hypercar class with the Valkyrie in uh, the World Endurance Championship. I think I did last time. Um, now they've also released the Aston uh, Aston Martin Vantage LM GT3, um, which again uh, Aston the Aston uh, GTE as it was called before it's gone back to GT3. Um, the Aston Martin GTE cars um, were all one of one of the highlights um, of the World Endurance Championship um, with their big brutish engines, uh, V8s, and they had the V12, the DBR. Was it, did they call it the DBR12? DBR9? That's what it was called. V12, DB9. That competed in the World Endurance Championship before it was turned to GTE. What they called GT1 cars still then? Anyway, yeah, so they have a new one, um, which is good. It's good to see Aston back. Um, they, they should always be in endurance racing, should Aston, uh, due to their history. Another sip of tea, hang on. Um, what else has happened? Again, not a whole lot. Oh, did you see, I, I found, um, and before I talk about that, actually, uh, Toyota launched, well, it's been spied, the Toyota Supra GR MN, yeah, it's GR MN, isn't it? Which, as, so GR MN must be a sub-brand of the sub-brand, because... As far as I'm aware, the Supra is a GR product. Like it's 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 called the GR Supra, isn't it? The normal one. But anyway, so GR MN being Gazoo Racing Masters of the Nurburgring, um, which we first saw on the Yaris, the Yaris that came out before the GR Yaris, the the Yaris so the previous generation, um, at the very tail end of that generation, and um, the Toyota Yaris GR MN MN. Um, which is an interesting. It's a 1.8 supercharged, 200 plus brake Yaris, front wheel drive, but with a clever diff, um, fancy brakes. Um, it's supposed to be brilliant, um, but it kind of just like it was limited run, short lifespan, and then the GR Yaris came out, obviously, which is obviously excellent. So it's kind of overshadowed. It's an interesting curio. Apparently, it costs 1,500 quid to replace the front brakes, um, and because it's so such a limited run car. They haven't got any cheaper. I don't know if they're necessarily even cheaper than a GR Yaris. So, hard to justify. But if you were a multi-gazillionaire, um, which I would love to be someday, I'd uh, consider having one of those in my garage. But yeah, I mean, it is going to be a super version of that, which will be nice because I like the new Supra, which I know there's question marks over the fact that it's, um, you know, it's essentially a BMW Z4 underneath. Um, but I like it. And you can get, especially now with the, the facelifted, because you used to be able to get the two liter four cylinder with a manual or a dual clutcher, um, and then there was the the V six, sorry, the straight six, um, but it was auto only. But then with the facelift, they offer a manual gearbox with the with the six cylinder engine as well. I think it looks great, especially in real life pictures. Don't do it justice. It's very striking, very Japanese. It's cool. I like it. Um, so yeah, six cylinder one of them with. The, uh, with the manual gearbox will be lovely. I don't know if the GRMN N one's going to be manual. As I said it's only been spied knocking around a few race trucks. Um, but look, the world's a better place for car with cars like that still being developed. Um, and other stuff on the world of Toyota. Um, they also, well, I assume it's a it's a rendering of a concept version of what the EV version of the Land Cruiser is going to look like. Um, all retro futuristic and angular, as is the way these days. Um, but their claim is going to have a range of 621 miles, which is uh, pretty impressive. Which is, is that a thousand kilometers? I think it might be because 100 kilometers an hour is 62 miles an hour, isn't it? So 621 miles must be a thousand kilometers. I could be wrong. I'm no mathematician. Um, look, yeah, I think again, EV especially with a range like that, EV power in a big 4x4 is actually a, 
actually pretty it makes a lot of sense um like stuff like rolls royces um you know the silent power um you know electric vehicles electric off-road vehicles because you can put you can put independent motors into each wheel making it four-wheel drive but also you can send power to any wheel at any given time um low down high low down torque for going up and down inclines and getting yourself out of, out of sticky situations and um you don't really have to worry about you can have just water seal the batteries and the electric motors and um you can wade to your heart's content because you don't have to worry about uh you don't have any water going into um into intake um you know to put well snorkels are cool on cars um but you won't need a snorkel on an ev land cruiser um it's, it's interesting because like, yeah so like it's it's a brand of vehicle where the the powertrain doesn't really matter although the diesel v12 land cruisers land cruiser amazons not v12 sorry v8 um diesel land cruiser amazons are, are kind of cool but you're not gonna we're not gonna cry um about the loss of the powertrains from future land cruisers um so i was thinking there it, it might book the trend of the thing that i think what what upsets us us car nerds about the ev is like yeah we'll, we'll miss combustion power and the sounds and the smells and the way it delivers power etc um it's it's those things it's, it's what those things evoke is they evoke emotion and it's it's, it's the lack of emotion in, in in electric vehicles that we're we're, we're worried about that they're always going to become ubiquitous white goods um which will mean that like if they're all the same and they're all competent um dynamics and any emo- emotional quality is going to get lost um, and that's where the sadness comes in um, I won't dive down down that route because that'll just get depressing um, anything else um, oh this, I found that the, the the original press car uh, for GT40 is up for sale um, I found it up on Piss and Head it's been sold through a, a dealership in the UK is it, is it I can't even read my own writing get away from me fly um, Fiskers Limited, um, but you'll find it up on Pissnets. Um, I want, uh, it's obviously POA because God knows how much that would be worth. Because original GD, GD40s are some of those, you know, unobtainium uh, level of cars because they only built a hundred and three or something. Um, original GT40s, most of them becoming race cars. So road legal, uh, sorry, road road variants, and um, they're road legal. And they're very like essentially it's one of the first Mark One GT forties. Um it was, you know, ferried around uh um motor shows and stuff back in the nineteen sixties. God knows how much that's worth. Um the Mark One not being the best looking of the four variants of the GT forty, but all GT forties look cool, um, by by default. And um, so God knows how much that's worth or how much it'll sell for, but um yeah. Check that out if you're interested. Maybe you aren't. Because if you got this far, um you're you're probably asleep. Um yeah, that's about it. I was sorry. I'm gonna take another sip of tea. I don't know why, but for the last few days, I've been thinking about um, the Cayman, the nine eight seven generation, so second gen, which is essentially a big facelift of the first generation. Um, the Cayman or of that generation, which is essentially so the the halo run out special variant um, of the Cayman, the nine eight seven generation Cayman. Um, you you can get into one of them now. I'm going off sterling prices because good luck trying to find an Irish one. But they range from about thirty to forty grand um, in the UK. Um, and from reading up on them from, from the last week after they kind of popped into my mind, um, all the reports of of test drives and stuff at the time really sang its praises. I mean, the Cayman has always been great, and it's the greatest Cayman of that generation. Um, it's so it's so like. And it's it's an expensive, it's expensive in the ter- in the terms of nine eight seven Caymans, but in the grander scheme of things, if you take it as the special Cayman of that generation, and just being a special Porsche generally, um, forty thirty forty grand seems like good value to me. And okay, I don't have forty grand spent on a car currently, but you know it is at least a, an obtainable um, performance car. Performance, a high performance Porsche at that, um, six cylinder manual Porsche, um, and like okay, I know the GT4 of the next two generations, um, is definitely uh, leaps and bounds ahead performance wise. You know, it's got the 
you know the the, the motorsport engines and uh, like you know GT three componentry and all, but you know they're in a different they're on a they're in a different league both performance and mo- and uh, monetary value. Um, so I think it came in or um, interest. I think the, if I had a bit of cash to spend on a sports car, if I had about thirty or forty grand to spend on a sports car, I think that would be very high up the shortlist. Um, there you go. There's a little, a little thing off the top of my mind that I just thought I'd throw in there. Um, yeah, this, it's, as I said, it's, it's been a slow week. Um, I've rambled on terribly as usual for thirty minutes, so I won't, I won't talk too much longer. I'm going to get another sip of tea because it's getting cold now because I've been talking for thirty minutes. Ah, delicious. Um, so I obviously have to talk about the Formula One because it's Sunday afternoon and it's been a sprint weekend. So we had. We had qualifying on Friday for for today's race, um, which is interesting enough because Charles Leclerc is on pole, Lando Norris is second, Lewis Hamilton is third, fourth is I can't remember who's fourth, um, but anyway, Max is sixth because um, he went over track limits on his final lap, um, which so it was deleted, um, and he was only the, the gap was only a point zero zero five. Um, before the lap was the lead. He, so he was on pole and Charles Leclerc was 0. 0.005 behind that. Um, but he, he, he went um, slightly wide in the final corner, which he abused track, track limits, so it got deleted. And he may have picked up that five thousandths uh, of a second by carrying more speed into the corner. So Leclerc is on pole by merit. However, it's sprint weekend. So we had the sprint race yesterday. Um, and the sprint race was at um, 11 o'clock. Um, so I was tired to begin with, but um, it was a very dull uh, sprint race. Because, um, you know, people have been kind of like, oh, sprint races are actually... I don't know where, like... If sprint races disappeared, I, I, I wouldn't care. Put it that way, I suppose, the, the shortest way of putting it. Um, again, to touch back on when I was in Austria um, for the Grand Prix last year, that was a sprint weekend. And as an attendee spectator, um, it was quite fun getting... Um, getting so much uh, competitive track time over the whole weekend um, but like they, they, they do take away from the main spectacle a bit like we, we got a bit greedy with this with this with the sprint races and um, so far this year because they've all been kind of um, incident strewn which added to the drama but then the one last night um, it was a bit dull not a whole lot happened and what it, what it did because it was it was very few in, little to no incidents in the ra- in the sprint race itself Um it's kind of told us how the race is going to play out today. Um, like Max will have the fastest car, um, so he, you know, he's only starting sixth. He'll probably be third or fourth from the start, and then he'll just pick off the rest of them. Especially because it's clear that um, Ferrari um, have terrible tire degradation, so they're probably going to drop back. They'll probably get jumped by the Mercs. Max will run off into the distance and, and win the race. Um, um, okay, you probably could have predict- predicted that kind of outcome. Regardless, but it's been absolutely compounded now by the uh, by the sprint race. But look, I'll still watch it. It's on at eight o'clock in the evening, um, which is nice enough. Um, I might have a, a wee glass of wine. I do like these evening races. We have this, um, we have Brazil, we have Mexico. Um, that was the last because I think Bahrain is going to be in the afternoon. I've, I've already talked about this before, um, and the Vegas race is going to be on. A, I think 6 a.m. in the morning because they're having a night time in Vegas. Um, but yeah, no, look, it's something to look forward to. It's nice to have you know some Formula One action to watch of a Sunday evening. Um, so we'll see. Maybe I hope I'm wrong. Hopefully, it's a very exciting race. Um, I'll talk more about Formula One next time around because I talked a lot about it last week, and we'll wait until the race actually happens before I say anything about any more about um, this week's Formula One. Other than the fact that the sprint race was a bit of a damn squib. Um, I don't have a classified find of the week for you this week because cars are just too expensive. It's hard to find anything that's um, interesting and reasonably priced. Um, the YouTube channel I'm going to recommend is uh, KEXP, um, which is an American subscriber-funded uh, radio station um, that plays alternative music. Um, but they do put up these great uh, live sessions with bands. You know, it's 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 you know similar to say like a live lounge or something like that, but you know, it's live performance in just by interview with the band. Um, so yeah, if you like music, check out KXP, KEXP and check out the live um, performances they have up there as a playlist on their channel. There's down, bound to be an artist in there that you enjoy 
um, and I get to see them do a great live performance on the radio. And the music I'll recommend this week is is this, this, the score, the soundtrack to Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's by Robbie Robertson, um, prolific uh, musician and known for his, his movie scores. Um, he's worked with uh, Martin Scorsese, Scorsese several times. Um, and unfortunately, he, he passed away this year. He passed away in August. Um, but the, this, the score um, for the movie is absolutely brilliant. There's all these kind of old western um, kind of slide guitar um, moody parts of the score which really adds to the tension uh, of the movie the pacing of the movie is very very good for three and a half hours and, and the score is a large part of that um, but yeah so check that out um, again if, if, if you have been listening this far again a very dull boring terrible podcast um, but if you have been listening um, up until this point I love you um, and as always, until I talk to you again, be safe, be well, I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.